Welcome to God of Rock. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special episode of God of Rock. We are honoring the memory of Ed Levy. Ed Levy was a assistant, assistant coach, and a coach for the New York Pioneer Clubs over 61 years. I have two very, very special guests tonight. The names are Valerie Levy, who is the widow of Ed Levy, and very special guest, the first woman pioneer, Isabel Eliasha. Listen, before we start, I will, one of the questions my audience asks me is, well, how did you know so-and-so? <laughs> And the way I met Isabel is through you, Valerie. Yes. In the first panel, you and Gary and Frank and Mitch were talking. And near the end, you went like this. There's something you guys haven't mentioned. And that the Pioneer Club didn't have women until Ed Levy took over. And among the best, you mentioned Isabel Elisha. I sure did. I, sir, I remember that. <laughs> I kind of know more about this, Isabel. So I contacted you. Sure I did. I said, I, I need to know the correct spelling. Not only did you tell me the correct spelling, but you gave me her phone number. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my gosh, this is very aggressive. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Texted her, I wanted some photos, you did. That first episode of the panel, it's been a big hit. So that's how I met Isabel through you. So Isabel. It's such a pleasure to know you. Thank you. You're, one of the things you're, you're starting to honor at Levy is a 5K. So tell us what inspired you and what is the status of this 5K? It's going to be at your school, I believe. Correct. I want you to know that Valerie Levy, through all these years, um, has made sure that after Coach Levy passed, to be in touch with us. To, to know everything about us. Valerie knows everything that goes on in my family. <laughs> she knows my children, my mom, my grandma. And she, met, grandpa. she met my grandpa, who already passed away. But uh, Valerie really, really made an effort after Coach Levy passed to keep in touch. Coach Levy was a very important person for me, and she is too. She has made sure to make me feel part of the Levy family, and I That's love her for that. Answer. Because when I first came here, I had no no family. I didn't have anyone. Well, before, we'll get to that. So but let's, let's talk about this the Ed 5K. Levy 5K. I yep. mean, the not 5K. many people have a 5K name after them. Exactly. So it and takes, this one? takes some initiative yes. to do this. Yes. Uh, but it was something that I have wanted to do for a really long time, but didn't have the tools and the resources to do it. But now, as a head of school, I do have the tools and the resources to do this. And, uh, and it was the right time and, and, and moment to celebrate a very incredible and special person that was Coach Ed Levy. Um, so, yes, it is the Edward Levy. Um, 5K run walk uh, by Alfreda International Academy and Latina Leads. I, I also volunteer for a nonprofit in Georgia, and it's a nonprofit empowered young Latinas to be in leadership. And I have done some work for them. Called the founder and, and asked her if she wanted to participate on this with me because I don't have. I mean, I have a lot of students, but. I needed more, um, and she said yes. So, and, and I felt that this was perfect because Coach was the first coach at the New York Pioneers Club that included women as part of the team. So this was the perfect way to honor him. For him, I hope to see that the first woman that he helped is now helping other females, mm -hmm. and especially not only in leadership, but also to have a healthy, lifestyle uh, and if they want to be a runners and and make that their profession to do that right the inaugural is going to be sometime next year you have a date yet um 
Um, correct. It's going to be next year. So I'm working with the city of Alpharetta and I want to thank the, the city of Alpharetta for uh, being so helpful during this process. Um, and we're talking about two tentative days, April 14 or May 5th. Do you have the course mapped out? Yes. Yeah, it will be start and end at the same spot. Correct. It will be right next to our school. There is a park right next to our school, Wetbridge Park. That is very popular. That's why the city has been so helpful in this sense to allow me to have the 5K um, at the park. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is the course going to be measured or is it going to be more of a fun thing? It's already measured, yes. And it is more fun. It is our very first 5K that the school is doing. And, and yes, it was a 30 pages application where I have 30 to, pages. 30 pages application, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are there going to be prizes for, for first? Or yes, second or yes, first? and time, and yeah. Oh, you're going to have a timer? Yes, this yeah. Is, this, is, this is big time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, before we turn to Valerie, uh, let's go back to you in terms of, tell us where you were born, and tell us a little bit about your childhood. Sure. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela, and I grew up there and moved to the U.S. when I was almost 22 or 22. Um, I started running back in, in Venezuela. I started as an accident, sort of when I was around nine years old. Uh, I was running at the beach. We, we went to, during the weekends, we, my, my parents were divorced and uh, my dad will take us to this club at the beach. Uh, and it wasn't like a fancy club or anything like that, but they did have uh, activities for the children. And back then at nine, my father thought that it was appropriate for me to be by myself uh, with my brother that was three years younger than me. <laughs> And luckily they had these activities. So I signed up for these running races and barefoot at, at the beach. And I won all of them. Ooh. And, and <laughs> the boys, the girls, everyone. And went back and my brother is so excited showing my dad all these medals. And, and my dad was excited too. And when I saw the reaction, that really meant a lot to me because it, it was a very difficult childhood. That time was difficult. My parents had a very uh, contested divorce, uh, battling for um, battling for custody, and uh, um, it, it was very difficult. And at that time. I couldn't see my mom, so it was, not to say the least, uh, a really dark moment in my in my childhood. And this, you were very young, so nine, ten. I was nine, nine, nine years old. Nine years old, exactly. A lot to process, and so this made me realize that that was something that I could make people happy around me, and also be happy. Uh, so I started running. Uh, school like during playground time I will chase people or ask people to race me and quickly I I had the reputation of like the fast girl and in a good sense, uh, in a good sense exactly <laughs> Isabel, he's the best oh really <laughs> yeah exactly and I became more and more involved in it uh, going into you know competitions among schools and same thing, I will register in all these races and I will win all these races. So this very, is now in, in, this is Venezuela, 10, in, 11 in years high old. School now, no, or? I'm talking 10, 10, 12 years old. By high school, I was already running for, for my district. Um, I was for five years in a row in, in Venezuela. I was the uh, state champion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, for four years second in, uh, in nationally and in Colombia too. I, I ran at the Colombian nationals because they invited the Venezuelan team and I also got second place. So I was an accomplished runner in Venezuela when I moved to the U.S. Why did you come to the U.S.? I, I, my dream was to go to the Olympics and represent Venezuela at the Olympic Games. 
And there were two ways to do that back then. And I believe that still today, that's still the case because Venezuela, unfortunately, and the Venezuelan uh, um, Track and Field Federation, they don't have a lot of traction uh, in, or support in their athletes. So athletes really to be successful internationally, they have to move and they have to leave and they either go to Europe and train in Europe, which is the case of Yolima Rojas, who is the Olympian. She, she won the Olympic Games in the triple jump for yeah. Venezuela. She is the best right now in the triple jump. She trains in Spain. Uh -huh. So either you go to Europe or you come to the U.S. And uh, going into the NCAA, it's a great pathway to then for your international okay, so your dream was to get into the Olympics representing Venezuela. Venezuela. And so you went to the Yellow Pages. How did you find Ed Levy? So back then, my boyfriend at the time, who later became my husband and the father of my children, was doing an internship here in New York. And we were talking about getting married and and uh, for me to come to, to the U.S. finally to run at the NCAA. But I needed a coach. At this time, I had no clue about how difficult it is to get into the NCAA. I had no idea. I just said, you know, if you're there, I'm going to go there and I'm going to run at the NCAA. So he, I asked him to look for a coach. And he went, someone at his internship told him about the Rut Runners Club. And he went to the Rod Runners Club and someone then gave Coach Levy's number to him. And then I called Coach Levy from Venezuela. I had to go to a pay phone and get quarters. Well, I mean, the equivalent of quarters, but Bolivares, and to make this phone call because at this time, my parents did not know that I was doing all this yet. <laughs> uh, okay, now you were about 19, 20 years old. I was, yeah, 20, 21, yeah. And uh, call him. Don't ask me how we understood each other, but somehow we managed to communicate with each other because coach spoke English and I spoke Spanish back then. Uh, but we agree on meeting and that I was coming and we agree on a date. And that was the date that I landed in New York City. Got married in Venezuela, came here and dropped everything at the hotel and then went to Central Park to meet coach that day. On, on that day. What a story. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah. why do you think, because the, at that point, uh, I guess Joe Jans had already passed and, and Ed moved logically to be the coach. Correct. This is 1996. So Ed took over in 1991. So five years later, he gets a phone call mm -hmm. and you become by all accounts, the first woman to join the Pioneers Club. Is that right? I don't, that's not totally accurate. Mm -hmm. um, between 1991 and 1996, there were other females that joined the club. Not many, but there were. Okay. But as I said originally, I think I mentioned, I don't believe that uh, Isabel was the first. I can't say that with definition. Of course, we can do the history, mm -hmm. but at that time, she was the best. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So you come to New York, and Levy he doesn't become your, just, just your coach. He Correct. becomes, he took you under his wing. He, he became a fatherly, grandfatherly figure, all in one pack. I mean, how did you luck out so so well? So, <laughs> so what was it about you, you think, that he saw your potential? I, I think where definitely during that time, there were not other girls with me. It was, it, the, the club was very small at that time. And uh, he will invite other female runners sometimes to be able to form a a relay so I could run in a relay race. Um, and I think that what, what he saw in me was that he, well, it was a challenge, definitely, <laughs> but also that he could apply everything that 
he believed and, and that he was standing for everything that the New York Pioneers Club stand for and everything that he believed, uh, he could do it with me. I was an outsider. I was, again, he, he was doing his social justice work of helping an immigrant in the great city of New York. Um, also, you know, doing his work of inclusion. And, and for him, human capital was very important. For Coach Levy, education was something that will help you be successful in life, but also something that will help you help others be successful in life. And, and he did that for me because he wanted me to be successful, but also use his education to help someone okay. else be successful. All right. You know, one of the uh, other panels that Pam Cooper uh, hosted, she mentions that the one of the hallmarks of these 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 clubs is they very much help their 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 athletes to be to get into schools, mm -hmm. to get jobs after school. So and the Pioneer Club is no exception. So he wanted you to get an education. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is not a club. This is this is this is a calling. You know, he's more of a. Uh, just beyond the call of duty, mm -hmm. becoming a, a coach. Mm -hmm. So, so, but you wanted that too. You wanted to, to oh. go for an education. What school did it get you into and how did you do? Yeah. So coach was uh, very knowledgeable uh, in every sense of that world, word. Um, but he also was very knowledgeable about the college system and, and, and how to and what was it that I needed. Um, and he knew that for the NCAA, you needed to be, uh, obviously have the times and be uh, a, a great athlete. I had that part. But you also need to speak English in, in order to enroll in college. And I did not have that part, but he believed that I could do that and he could help me out. Uh, and he also knew that it was a lot of networking, like going around and talking to coaches and, and telling coaches, you know, look at this runner, because that is, that is done. Uh, many universities go to Jamaica and they go to the Jamaica Relays, which I had an opportunity to go with the um, New York Institute of Technology. And uh, the entire country, of Jamaica is right there running the Jamaican relays and all the American universities are there and coaches are looking and and that's how the process of recruiting starts, at least the one I witnessed in, in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So here coach did the same thing locally and went to different coaches and talked to the coaches to see me running. He knew exactly to what races to take me because he knew which coaches were going to be there. Uh, so he knew which races were important for me to be at. He will register me in those uh, events. He will tell me that, you know, this is where we're going. This is why we're going to these events. Oh, gosh. No pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, it sounds like New York Institute of Technology offered you a scholarship. That's the one I accepted. That's but that was not more. the only offer I got. Correct. Oh. I got three offers. Uh, it was a CW Post offered me a full scholarship. Uh, Forham University offered me a half a scholarship. The problem with Forham was it was a half a scholarship yeah. because it was Division One. I. I had the times to run in Division One, but I don't. Ha I did not have the whole eligibility because I had already started college in Venezuela, so I was not as important or beneficial for them because my eligibility was not intact. But for Division Two because I was coming from Venezuela, which has no uh, indoor season. I had my entire indoor season eligibility intact because I have not done that. The same with cross country. So I, I ran cross country for the New York Institute of Technology, even though it was not my race. I was the only, actually, during that time, I was the only cross country runner for the <laughs> New York Institute of Technology. Uh, and then, and then I ended up choosing the New York Institute of Technology for two reasons. It was a full scholarship too, 
but they were very flexible. Coach Sino, who was the coach, both Coach Levy and Coach Sino, they had a, a lot of respect for each other. And Coach Sino allowed me to live in the city because I was already newly married and he was okay with me not living on campus. And also New York Institute of Technology has multiple campuses and there is one here in the city uh, and two in Long Island. And um, also he allowed me to continue to run uh, during the week with coach and then I will meet the team on Thursdays and then train at the armory with the team on Thursdays and then travel during the weekend. So even though I was the New York Institute of Technology, he allowed me to continue to do a lot of training with coach. Coach Levy. Coach Levy, correct. And that was why that was part of my my decision. That's terrific. terrific yeah. That the coaches work together because they knew each other and, and wanted to help you. But but you you played an important role because you you allowed yourself to be coached. You allowed yourself to trust Absolutely. what Ed would say and what the other coach would say. You you didn't fight them. You may sometimes well, I don't really want to do that, but you know, you you got results. Yeah. But then, but then Coach Levy himself was an educator. I learned later that he became a school principal. Not only was he coaching, which is a full-time job, but he also had another job as a teacher. So him being a teacher, did that influence your career choice? Absolutely, 100%. And Valerie, I, I want you to know, I started writing a book about Coach. It's, it's about Coach through my eyes and my experience, the experience of an, of an immigrant. And absolutely influenced me. And what I want you to know is that part of what I say in the book is that this was a two-way relationship with, where we both needed each other for sort of like the same things, but different things. Uh, for Coach, Coach was retired. He was a retired principal when he was my coach. And I think that it was satisfying for him to sit down with me after practice every day to go over my homework and then, mm -hmm. you know, correct my homework and teach me grammar and history. And he became my history professor. Uh, work on my pronunciation too, because I honestly, I did not speak English when I met him. So I think it was satisfying for him to go back to that time when he was a teacher and then a principal and helping a, a student. Uh, and then for me, he became that. He became my private tutor, my coach, uh, father figure. Uh, so, and, and actually much more than that. I think I, I got the better deal. <laughs> he, he did so much for me. So, why and how did he influence my decision to be an educator? And this is the part that I think it's that I want people to know, and especially educators, administrators, uh, the, the New York Public District. And it was the fact that he believed in me. He saw me as, as someone that only needed to work and then doing the work with support was going to be successful. Uh, in, in, the, in the college system, yes, it, it is respected if you are a student athlete. But if you have an accent, if you, if you are an English, if English is your second language, there is always that sense of you have a deficit. It's not seen as you're a bilingual person. You, and, and coach saw that gift and it saw that as a gift in venezuela if you are an athlete you can be a professional like the two and two do not go hand in hand if you many times i got in trouble at school or in college because i had a, a big race a big competition and i went and asked you know my first semester of first year of college i asked my math professor and said i need to miss miss this test because i'm going to nationals uh, by the way, I was the equivalent of the NCAA champion in Venezuela for the 400 meters. Mm -hmm. 
And here is my professor saying, well, if you are going to this race, I'm not going to do this test for you again. You will fail because you either have to, you either have to choose whether you want to be a runner or you want to be a student, but you no, cannot this, be this, both. This is, this is back in Venezuela. Okay, yes. New York, I mean, in, in the United States. In the United States, it's because because different. you got a scholarship or be a student. Correct. So they, they know to work with you. Here, actually, you know, after the NCAAs, my professors stop the class and say, how, how was it? Uh, and then, you know, my, my fellow students will be, you know, all excited that I went to the NCAA. So in that sense, yes, here you have the support of being a student athlete. Is the piece of English being your second language that, that is seen as a deficit? And coach did not see that. Coach saw that as a gift, as she only needs this little support and then she will fly. And, and that's what he did, and I believed him. And, and it was the very first time that someone showed me that believing as a whole me, I was like, yes, I can be all these things. And I believed that too. I, I did not see it as impossible. I was like, absolutely, I'm gonna learn this, I'm gonna do this, and I'm going to end to love with this, and I'm, I'm gonna get all this down. And I Not only doing that, but... <laughs> Obviously, because you have children, you were also at some point raising young, young, young children. Correct. You have two, I think. I have three. three. And they're all bilingual. They're all bilingual. <laughs> that, that is amazing. If somebody says, you know, I, I want to be like Ed Levy, mm -hmm. how can somebody become and do the things that Ed Levy did? I don't think you need to be a running club, although the running clubs back in those days were just amazing, you know. It's not unique. These other things have happened as well, especially with the pioneer clubs. The other people, other athletes went on to be judges, actors, very famous. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but, you, but actually, there's something really different about you than the others. The others are very, very elderly, or they, or they passed on. You are, are in your prime. <laughs> you still have a lot of potential. You can carry the pioneer club to the next generation and beyond. And you already started that at your school with the, with the, with the Pioneer Club. So, but, but you're just one person. How do you think this could be replicated in other ways? Is it through education? Is it, is it, is it, what do you think is the process? I honestly think that is changing the mindset in districts, in schools, because many schools have great um, athletic programs, um, and and they are the YMCA. There is a, other organizations out there that that have activities for children, but they still have the same mindset of, you know, black students. Uh, you know, they they are failing in schools and Latinos, and and it is a, a culture that tends to see minorities as having a deficit and not minorities having a gift. And that sometimes minorities need support, yes. And, and that is okay. That is what it's supposed to be done in an educational system because everybody needs support, not only minority students. Why students do need support too. Uh, so it's, it's changing the mindset that support is something that should be embedded. In, in any curriculum and then it not seen as something that one person, a one very special person has to do outside of the school. No, if it's, if we change the mindset that students need support, what do they need? And, and it's as simple as asking students, what do you need? What is happening at your house? How do you feel today? That is something that coach did every day when he was driving me home every night after practice. He really wanted to know who I was as a person okay. to make me a better runner. Okay. Well, let's turn to Valerie. Mm -hmm. Valerie, where did this gift that Ed Levy had come from? Where do you think? I mean, did, there wasn't YouTube videos that you can watch how to be a coach. He had to figure it out himself. Same thing with Joe Jansen. Back in 1936, when he founded the Pioneer Club, there wasn't other models that he could follow. Absolutely he had to, he not. had to write his own book. He had to, he had to figure it out himself. He, 
obviously, Ed came in as a young person. I think he was 14. He was 16. He so, so what made Ed, Ed? Well, I think um, adversity, for one thing. When he was in high school, he tried to run desperately. All of his friends were running, and track was just his his love his passion at the time i can't say a passion yet but definitely um he had a love for track and field but when he was seven years old he um had an accident in his home which resulted in him breaking his hip and he developed osteomyelitis which caused as he was growing he was seven at the time, one leg to be shorter than the other. So as much as he tried, he was physically unable to run. So I always in my heart admired him for not walking away and saying, oh, well. He um, went up to Joe one day at at the uh, at one of the meets and asked if he could help out so to speak you know can i be a a helper or whatever an intern an intern if you will yeah. i never discussed this with joe but i think he looked at ed and and saw this 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 love this instant pull that he had for track and his um, love of the club and said, sure. Well, he came in and helped all right so much that Joe began to rely on him more and more because Joe had a job, <laughs> you know, and his, mm. his full-time employment often made it difficult for him to be at point A at 10 o'clock. Mm. So there was Ed to fill in, and as it uh, progressed, he became the manager of the team. At the age, tender age of? Of 16. Wow. Amazing. I'm, I'm amazed at that as well. But his own, his own love of the sport, I think, was driven. He wanted to be a part of it. And because he physically couldn't be a part of it, he threw himself into the administrative end, and it opened up a whole new career for him. And, and again, this is something he learned on his own. Did he go to school to learn? No, accounting? he did not. <laughs> he, he, he learned by doing. He learned by doing. And I think Joe Yancey's granddaughter said at some point that you do learn by doing and you you take you take what you have and you make what you want and that's how new yorkers do it and he was unable to run physically so he gave his whole self into managing the club and helping athletes become better men oh my god the new york pioneers did that in in, in, in so many ways so he didn't see himself as disabled he never simply saw himself. I ha I have a different talent that I can mm -hmm. contribute. Coach, let me tell me what you need. And he said, Oh, you need to manage the books. You need to figure out where to be at certain times, the exactly. hotels. No. So he was. He you was, know, that's one. That's another thing in my head. <laughs> um, as an adult, I always try to remember um, that I I want to share with everyone, Coach never acknowledged himself mm -hmm. as a disabled person, mm -hmm. ever. Whatever there was to do, he did it mm -hmm. in his own way. Um, and he encouraged all of his athletes to do the same thing. And I don't mean to be dramatic, but this is very true. If you were to ask me today which of his legs was the shorter, the left or the right, I couldn't tell you <laughs> because he never 
acted as a disabled person. I mean, physically, he never gave into it. He figured out how to live with it, either from the, right the age shoes, seven. the right clothing, the right physical therapy. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of things. But but again, you know, back then, it, it, it wasn't as if you could go to a specialized doctor because there weren't any. Well, that's something I left out back in those days. They didn't have the advances in medicine that they have today that would have been able to uh, ensure that both legs yeah. at some point were equal. They didn't have that then. Yeah. yeah. But he lived with it. And by the way, he was one fantastic dancer. <laughs> Cause you don't need a whole lot of evenness you know, <laughs> when you dance. He could out, and he, he was really impatient with me because I didn't have the, the moves, the, the looseness, the balance, the this. <laughs> but he, it, it was a joy to watch him on the dance floor. How long were you guys married? So he was actually longer with the Pioneer Club at this point. Yes. 61 years, 45 years with you. Yes. And you saw you saw the whole thing. I mean, you were there. Everything. At the last part, you saw him take over from Joe Jancy. That must have been very difficult to pick up the club from this this giant of a man that has done so much. And he had, a, he had to carry the ball. If it was difficult, he never showed it. He put his whole self into it. He admired Joe so that I felt, I think, and we never really discussed it in these kinds of terms and words, but I felt that he felt, well, it's expected of me. Of course I'm going to take over, and of course it's going to move forward and be the best it can be. And Isabel was one of the beneficiaries of that. Yes, absolutely. How Joe passed away very relatively young, 75 or so. What happened? Why did he pass? D did you mean Joe or Ed? Ed? I meant Ed Levy, actually. Oh, he had prostate cancer. Oh. Yeah. And it was only when he became, um, when his illness began to affect his body physically, that he um, resorted to a cane. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's another disease you can catch early with the proper blood tests and mm -hmm. the proper exams. Well, it's, it's yeah, and you can also tests. live with it for a good while. He did. But that's what took he him away. Because unfortunately, there's no obituary of him that I could find. No, there wasn't. It's too bad. Well, to end this on a Hopefully, positive note. One of the people I'm going to be meeting early next year, she's the obituary writer for the New York Times, and she's also the author of a book called Overlooked. It's about people whose obituaries were missed. Whatever reason that should I've not have been. I've seen that in the Times, yes. I already mentioned to her, Good. Ed Levy, and a few other people that I've heard. So maybe. She will contact you and will do an obituary in the, in the New York Times in the mm -hmm. Overlook section. Can't make any promises. Oh, I know, understand <laughs> that. And one thing I was going to, when you have the program for the 5K, mm -hmm. maybe there could be a short history, absolutely. You know, of the club and its beginnings and absolutely. so on. I think it would be excellent to expose the children mm -hmm. to that history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any, any final words, Isabel, as we close the show? Yes. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to honor the most important person in my life, um, a true hero. Um, as I said before, he, Coach Levy was a role model and the best 
role model that a young immigrant like myself could have ever hoped for. I also I want to take this opportunity to say how um, Coach Levy, who was a black man from the South Bronx, and the New York Pioneer Club, who is also a black club from Harlem, um, they all supported so many people, including myself. And you know, too often there is too much talk about and, and the mischaracterization of black men. Coach Levy was a great father, um, a great mentor, a great professor, a great principal, a great person. And he was a black man from the Bronx. And I hope uh, for many people to see that. I want to celebrate that. I want that to, to I want to say that as loud as I can because the black community deserves to be recognized for the great men that they have and the great women that they have and for the support that they give to other communities because i am an example of supporting a very total different community <laughs> the beautiful thing is you have that potential you already started so so it's going to be wonderful to see what you're going to accomplish in the next mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 years. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much for you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You got to run with Will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got to run with Will. <laughs> they probably caught that. But you know, one thing we didn't say, well, maybe in your panel, but Ed had standards. Mm -hmm. that he never lowered for anything or anybody. And that is so borne out in your relationship because even though you couldn't speak English and your term papers were riddled with errors, mm -hmm. he never lowered his standards no. to make it easier for her to pass, did he? No, no. They stayed up here. No. Thank you for coming! Thank you!